I'm going to ask you for a moment to suspend uh, your astonishment, at least at that respect, and ask you to uh, consider uh, the fact that the three of us and some of our students and many other physicians believe that poetry can be an important adjunct to self-awareness, to reflective practice. The name of our from a physician poet named John Stone, who was an invasive cardiologist uh, at Emory in Atlanta, and who was really uh, outside of the, even outside of the field of medicine, really a major American poet in the last part of the 20th century. Now, one of the final poems that John wrote, uh, at least during the last couple of years of his life, 
was a sonnet called Transplant. And I want you to imagine an operating room in which you have the recipient of a heart transplant. And it has reached the stage where they have removed his diseased heart. And so you have an empty chest cavity. And then you have someone come into the room with their little packet, bringing the replacement heart. And the replacement heart is the new heart that's placed into the man's chest. So let me read this sonnet to you. Within the green purpose of the room, there were 10 beating hearts, but now are nine, who help the otherworldly pump assume the flow of blood along the plastic line by which the tenth now lives and has his being, which is slow asleep, but dreams of moving, of breathing on its own, of dimly seeing its alien toes awaken, all ten approving the knitting of this widely open chest, where now there is no heart, but only pocket until the circling mercy comes to rest as nearly as an eye within its socket. And then, then the shock, the charmed electric start, the last astonished harvest of the heart. Now, of course, in this poem, the astonished harvest is the concept of harvesting the heart, how astonishing that is, and then restarting it in another person. But, of course, John was a poet. And the more, the wider implication of this is the basic astonishment of what we do, and what we experience in medicine. And that astonishment can find its outlet, essentially, in poetry. But it's, it's, it's even more than that, because it's through the reflective practice of writing about these experiences better self-awareness and better understanding, not only of yourself, but of patients, and perhaps a better, more satisfying experience of medicine. You know, I used to run a, a, an elective in narrative medicine, and uh, students would write journals, and these are just two quotes from uh, fourth-year student journals, and I want to direct your attention particularly to the second line, the practice of medicine is simply poetry in motion. The art of medicine is a validation of everything that makes the human experience. I learn more about myself than I ever imagined. Now, what is it about poetry? Uh, she, she calls uh, the practice of medicine poetry, poetry in motion, but some people <coughs> Toil-worn woman and their 
loves and enjoys their star artists and their groups. So what are we talking about? Well, it seems to me there are four aspects of the, this relationship between poetry and I would say other narrative and narrative. First of all, empathy. As Clark Williams said, the patient himself would shape into a person that called for attention. Secondly, the imagination to recognize the true poetry of life. Third, storytelling. We owe it to each other to respect our stories and to learn from them. And finally, solidarity with the ordinary man, the plain well poor water man, etc. Um, and so I want to submit to you that in this day when reflective practice has become uh, a major movement really in medicine, uh, ways of being able to uh, reflect on our activities and to learn from them, to develop our characters or our experiences, um, that poetry plays a role. Personal reflection, mindfulness, small group projects, we're all familiar with these, reflective writing, and one type of reflective writing, of course, is poetry. So I want to end this In those days, he wore vestments in clinic, pressed white pants, white shirt and jacket, symbols of purity, but magnets for stains, his pockets puffed with instruments and memory aids. He began by asking questions while fumbling with his notes. He squinted into his patient's lenses for sclerotic vessels. He palpated their abdomens, allotted their livers, and listened to respiratory crackles while disguising the depth of his doubt with a kind of serious look. It was difficult. He was surprised to find how much he disliked some of the patients, rude and demanding, manipulative, violent and bent, shrinking violets that made him squirm, paranoid addicts, and a few that goaded his deep anger. He tried to remember to step away. The secret of the care of the patient, his professors had told him, lies in caring for the patient, a maxim he was certain cut to the core of feeling. In time, he convinced himself all this rigmarole of anger and hurt would work itself out. He'd grow in wisdom. He'd ascend to a higher, more open plane. Headache, anger, fatigue, and doubt would disappear it's bound to get easier, not easier. The second poem kind of goes to the other end of the scale, right? an end of the scale that I, uh, I think most of us rarely reach, but I think it's a great thing to be useful. This is called The 600 Con Man. And this relates to a 600 con Jamaican man on two beds in an ICU dying of Of the 600 pound man on two beds, nothing remained. Not the bleariness with which he moved his eyes, nor the warm oil purling in his beard. Though the sheets and plastic bags are gone, his grunts, his kind acceptance gone, I see him now, rising in the distance, an island, mountainous and hooded with impenetrable vine. When I awaken to the death, the 600 pound man and cannot sleep again, I paddle to his shore in search of those flamboyant trees that fling his flank, in search of the bougainvillea blooming his thigh, of women who rise to touch him tenderly with ointments, in search of healers, singers who wrestle souls of old bodies back to bones, back to dirt, and back, back to their beginnings. And I enter for the first time the medicine circle, bearing chickens in honor of the gods, 
words dancing from my lips. Spirit, like the plume of a child's volcano. And then, then the medicine is good. And the medicine is good. And the tongues, the tongues are dancing. And the fathers, oh, the fathers are dancing. And this worthless and alien body, this 600-pound man, Sciences and 
this undergraduate education, uh, and also giving a demanding schedule, the, the transition from undergraduate into medical school education is, is, is a, can be a difficult one. And it demonstrates that medical school irrelevance to them of reading uh, and writing poetry. So with that background, uh, we have invited three students uh, to uh, come up and who had been in our workshop and took the astonished poets, poetry collective to come up and talk a little about their experiences and if they want to read a poem, you know, Lee Feinberg, Julia Sieko, uh, and then the third student, uh, Peter Fisher, who actually I was mentoring for an MD in the Institute for Humanities, couldn't make it, but she sent me a PowerPoint <laughs> and a poem for me too. Now that'll be the end. So anybody, do you want to start? Sure. So, so Eve's graduating, she's going into neurology at Steinberg. charming nurses with old love poems memorized when he was young. The poems all have moods in them as I listen along, huge and glowing and constantly calling young lovers to leave their home and to escape into the night. I was told to interpret the famous cardiothoracic surgeon's MRI scan. Each sliced image was studded with darkened spheres resembling warm raisin bread. The diagnosis was a vicious threat a gun I am being taught to aim. I find myself wanting to take him away instantly. Have you ever seen CJ deep D a lot, he asked. No, I said, it's an important case. He agrees, it is amazing. This is the end for the famous cardiothoracic surgeon. He is, this is his stage going dark, or his D train running out of track, leaving me fighting to remember who wrote those silly love poems, and a name I can only Be 
able to uh, uh, say it in more non-medical terms. So my, my next poem is about my experience in the neurosurgery operating room recently. It's called Better. From Latin to English, Dura Mater, Tough Mother, her surface peeking through the window, an orifice recently forged, the brain case taut between two pins, framed with sterile towels, rock music in the background. Finishing up, almost done. The blood pours out, an evacuation. He went too far. Motherfucker, we need two more units. No more rock music, just obscenities. The tough mother, barely visible through the red sea. Get, a mo get another motherfucking surgeon in here. Blood cascades at the surgeon's feet, the gushing flows. The other surgeon arrives. He confirms, you went too far. To himself, the first surgeon says, the opposite of good is better. And um, so he, he was trying to, to say that sometimes you go too far in medicine in an attempt to be, to be perfect. And he had actually done the surgery successful, and then he decided to go a little bit more and be a little bit more perfect, and then he caused this big brain bleed. Um, and I just like the way he said it, like, you know, the opposite of good is better, because I sort of have my own way to say that, which is um, the opposite of good is perfection. So I, you just remember, I find that going through this poetry course, um, I try to, like, take things I hear every day in the hospital and write them down and try to use them. Either I think about the exact thing that's happening and write about it, or I think of just the phrase that so my most recent one, um, it was Saturday, and I was exhausted. I had been working, I'm on my sub internship um, in nephrology, and I had been working for six days in a row, and I was in the ER, and I really hate the ER. It's like way too loud for me. Um, and we're standing there talking to a patient, and he's, um, he's not doing well. He has multiple metastases, and I keep looking at the clock, and the clock doesn't work. And it keeps saying 10.44 and 18 seconds. And I'm, I'm dying here. I'm just like, I need to go home. It's Saturday, it's 4 p.m. I have tomorrow off, my one day off. And I said, you know what would be the best title for a poem? It's 10.44 and 18 seconds. Mm -hmm. And so you just sort of get these, these things that you, you pick up um, and it helps you cope. Because in that moment, all I wanted to do was escape and I wanted the time to go and it wasn't. Um, and I got to escape just in that moment thinking about the poem that I was about it. And then I just have a, a few more little thoughts. So um, just going to the group itself, you have to, I know Dr. Rumpf and I have talked about this, you have to be really open. People will criticize your, or they give you constructive feedback on your poetry. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, um, I grew up with two writers. Um, my parents both um, got masters in English, they're both writers, and I'm terrified of writing poorly. So it's scary to bring your poetry to a group of other people, especially such a team poet. Um, but you have to print it out. Everyone writes on your piece of paper. Uh, they all talk about it. It's like you're shaking, I shake. Um, so, but uh, one thing in medicine is you have to learn early on that you're going to be wrong a lot. And you just have to be really open to that. And showing your, your poetry to other people is one of the scariest things you can possibly do. Um, definitely. And things are, are really tough in medicine. And sometimes terrible day and the only thing you can do is think about how you would write about it later. My first two weeks of my third year were on OBGYN, or were on the labor and delivery floors, which are a lot like the ER in that they're very loud and not, not my style. Um, so I wrote down, I must have like 14 pages of stuff I wrote down after those two weeks, just stories about everything. And now forever I will always have these 14 pages of my two first weeks. Another thing um, I wrote down is sometimes you cry and you just don't know what to do about it. And writing is really what you can do about it. Um, because you can't really cry on rounds. It's like not very professional. <laughs> so, so you just have to take out your phone, take out your notes, and write down what you think you want to write about later. Um, and then the other, other thing is sometimes we had uh, prompts in the group. And my favorite prompt was um, Scrubs. Because I wrote a, um, a poem about a 
imagining myself coming in on a Sunday, um, picking up my scrubs as if from the altar while you know my family is at church. So it's just like this uh, idea of myself in the future that doesn't exist yet. And whereas another poet wrote about the term scrubs, a colloquial term meaning um, you know uh, a man who cheats on you, like a, a I don't want no scrubs kind of person. And like I didn't even think of it that way. So it's cool to have these words that provoke very different reactions in people, and the group gave people an outlet to think about um, medical words differently. And it, it's been a really amazing experience. Um, and I wish more people would follow through on it in their third and fourth years, because that's when the writing really um, helps you decompress and, and cope with these experiences where the clock's not working and you just want to get out of the hospital. <laughs> so thank you so much. establishing an online presence uh, in terms of, of a blog. So, so my dad, I grew up in a medical house, so my dad was a GP, and uh, he, he sped off and left the house before I got up. Sometimes, sometimes the whistle would revelate to wake me up, and then he left. And uh, I'm gonna read two poems that deal with my interaction. Um, the first is called Imperfect Knowledge. And it, basically reflects on how we, we work in ignorance, but we parse our knowledge of what we do. Sometimes we do things we don't want to do because we're ignorant. Imperfect knowledge. My toes wiggle, skeletal, with their new shoes, big toes, little ones, as x-rays pass through me. No worry of Brenton's or Rand's. I stepped off the podium, I stepped off a pedestal, laughed, and the shoe salesman smiled and said, look again if you like. And we both watched the goodness of the fit. My father, a general all-around doc, made use of x-rays too. How many chest stones did he perform to set fractures under philoscopy? Not realizing danger of overexposure, no lead to shield his body. In the end, did it matter? Heart disease caught up with him, his hundred patient days not cancer. After the first coronary, his face, a fractured moon, gray within the mist of a plastic oxygen tent. I thought he would break apart, never return to us. Before the lethal second blow, I saw him in the kitchen, taking red pills from the fridge. Estrogen, he said. They tell me it's good for my heart. I'd grow breasts if I had to. Yes, yes, I hoped then, but now no, it wasn't so. You know, there was a theory that there was a coronary artery disease, just uncommon in women, except that the medical ones that somehow estrogen was protected. So actually giving the estrogen promoted the disease in men who were taking it. Uh, the second poem also relates to him. Um, to his violin. I found you abandoned in the attic of my boyhood home your broken bridge, rusting strings, and testimony to disregard. When had you last sung? In what year did he hold you in his loving hands? Can you sing me a song of my lost father, of the times we had together, the long dead maestro, and you, his prima donna? When did he last place you in your case when you have waited? in aging velvet until gently lifted from that grave resting place and I stroked your strings. If I were to raise your frayed bow, touch so lightly those strings, would you whisper why you lost interest, left you longing in your case? What was his new love that led to this estrangement? What ruled him that nothing else mattered, his music, his family, Sing me a song of my lost father, of the times you had together. Tell me of his passion. Whisper his secrets so that I may understand. You know, he, he had a wonderful practice. He was one of the largest in the Bronx after the Korean War. Uh, he was dedicated to that. He was dedicated to us, but he was so pulled into the practice that it was enveloping. It was one of the things that I learned from in terms of my own medical. Anyway, so that's So hi everyone. I'm uh, Maria Basil and um, one of the co-founders of Astonished Harvest. And uh, we at the time wanted there to be a place that um, would engage students drag our poetry kicking and screaming into the 
21st century. Um, and so we started um, a blog for, for a few different reasons. Um, we purposely um, made it a place that where um, students could post their poems and, um, and have us do sort of what we were doing at the workshop, but you know, a little bit more um, anonymously or a little bit more, you know, not in front of us and, and that kind of thing. So it was a way for them to post even the very early iterations of, of the stuff that they were writing. And then it also was a place to, um, to protect that whole process. Um, we made it a private um, site and then um, for that reason, then anything that they post on the blog um, is protected um, if they ever want to publish it. Um, the copyright still belongs to them and it's never and it can be submitted as never having been published or made public um, on the blog. So um, and so that's basically what I just said that um, that we kept it private that members would post on there and then have an ability to give comment on everybody else's poems um, and uh, that the work that's posted there is protected um, for, for later publication. So the um, website is astonishedharvest.blogspot.com and it is protected for, um, for uh, the members of Astonished Harvest only. Um, and this is uh, the version of it today. So every day there is a poem that is um, posted. So there's something for you to read. Um, also, and then this is the area where the poems are posted. Um, there's a little page about the three of us with everybody's favorite picture. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, um, there's a schedule and uh, directions um, to how to get to the Satake neighborhood house. And then there are the assignments or the prompts that Regina was talking about uh, the class and the goals of, um, of our MCS2 selective Astonished Harvest, um, as well as then the different prompts that, um, that one can give, <coughs> writing, about, writing about the first thing that you see in the morning, writing about something that you overheard during rounds, um, also reading assignments, and then some audio So the three things that um, that I think that that Dr. Coolahan and Dr. Bronson and our medical students have um, have shown us and demonstrated already is that there is that there is mindfulness in medicine and the poetry of medicine that there is great attention to detail that there's an opportunity to um, to demonstrate empathy and to represent our patients and that there is a great opportunity to affiliate and to find the, the core of what is human in all of our experiences. And so I wanted to share some poems with you that I have on the blog that deal with those three um, issues. So the first one is about is um, called Attending Privileges. And um, like Regina, um, oftentimes I write about um, before I was a doctor and, and what my
So I was the eldest of four, a full 12 years old, that morning in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, so proud that I was the only one allowed to make rounds with Daddy, while the rest of you waited in the car. April 30th, 1977, it said on the back of the daily news at the nurse's station. I focused on counting shiny black and white celebrating your seventh birthday, waiting in the car for Daddy and I to finish making rounds, hoping we'd make it to see Ed Figueroa pitch, though we missed your favorite Ron Guidry yesterday. 49, 50, 51, I hope you didn't have to help me. So sometimes we do have to, um, to share the, um, the stories of a patient. Um, and so I wrote this poem called Doing the Math. Um, I don't know how I got cervical cancer, or maybe I do. The doctor said 99.9% .9 chance I, it was caused by a virus. say, if you want an omelet, you have to break some eggs. And these two are perfect. They're shells, faint pastel, just in time for Easter, trembling at the bedside, awkward, formal, and polite, with the lady kind enough to be their grandmother. I want to break them, to say it's okay to ask the questions out of order, or spend more time when she stops to Fill their yellow yolk on the meat of her ribs, in the pan of her fears, to become the omelet, to make omelets of their own. Well, um, was, <coughs> the third student couldn't be here, which Queen Elizabeth, but Queen is uh, graduating. Non-judgmental environment, you're in a field of comfort, sharing your writing, even if you were self-conscious about it. I felt that I was getting advice from decorated and experienced poets who understood how to give me suggestions that applicable 
at my concert level, who's writing in my own style. Students are giving prompts every session if it looks more bad, I found that this was very helpful because I it kept my tone and as you focus on one topic, very helpful for a new writer. It's very inspiring, humbling to hear poetry from older and experienced writers. Very flattering that they were taking our suggestions and advice seriously, even as students, first time writers. I was never confident in writing poetry before this course. It scared me and I felt like my writing st sounded stupid. But now I'm confident to at least try and experiment because I have effective graphical writing tools. What did you learn? I found my own style of poetry, rhyming versus not rhyming, what length should my poems be, when to break my sentences, how to use every word effectively, tools, alliteration, metaphors, formatting. I learned that there are so many types and styles of poetry and how to elevate mind to make it more modern and less stereotypical. So I was feeling more confident to write my own poems at my own true time and pace, even outside of the chorus and felt happier that my writing sounded better. I learned patience with writing. Um, not every piece is done when you put it, when you, uh, when you put your pen down, the editing process can take years, as you know. The most important thing I learned, reflection is key to self-awareness and emotional maturity. Medicine is an emotionally trying field, and you need to reflect on your experiences in whatever manner you choose. Poetry may not be for everyone, but this course simply introduces you to the tools and foundation of reflection that you can <coughs> take what you learn and run with it. Choose whatever method <coughs> works for you, writing, reading, art, dance, cooking, but please reflect <coughs> to gain maturity and self-awareness. You can always <coughs> make <coughs> yourself the best doctor possible when you understand your shortcomings, your vulnerabilities. Since this course ended, I have become a much more reflective person and learned how to use poetry to understand what I am feeling and how to work through these emotions as to not project them onto my patients and colleagues. And finally, the bottom, what's the bottom line? The Spanish project, I didn't tell you. seems endless, incurable, light as sparse, darkness abundant, and the disease as cold as the snow outside. Warm, humidified breath is replaced by icy, harsh wind. It slaps your face like the prognosis that the tumor has resurfaced. Still, melting snow gives rise to hope, resurrected from the depths of icy despair and slushy, salt-stained roads. Hope that highlights happiness in looming tulip buds, clear skies, and winter coats abandoned to the back of closets. In one day when you least expect it, miraculous acts of divine mercy, the sun, too, returns, ripping off your covers and kissing your wounds with its warm embrace. It comes with memories of open windows, hair blowing in the wind, songs of summer love, and short skirts. Spring is the food I take with my medication, is the light at the end of my tunnel, reassurance that the end is near.
the discussion if people want you to talk about more of what you do or give us any type of reaction to what you've said. So reading was something that I was quite drawn to and um, kept up with. But um, the own act of writing, specifically also poetry, was something that I didn't really have much experience with. Um, and so I thought this was a great outlet because when I came to medical school, it was almost like all color kind of drained. Like I was not using any of what I had done previously in my other life. Um, and even though I'm not Painting, there is that same sort of space that you go to that I find when you're thinking about writing or poetry. It's that same sort of kind of um, expression and communication skills that I would find often with, you know, Photoshop or a paintbrush. And now I find it more immediate um, in trying to pick out the right words. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. I'm actually an undergraduate in the Massage and Medicine program at Stony You don't have to apologize. <laughs> so, um, personally, I, I applied to Stony Brook and got into um, being interested in medicine by, I used to go to different nursing homes and say my poetry and sing to the patients, and that's how I was introduced to the field, and I just thought that it was, sometimes music and medicine and po music and poetry can do so much more than just something a simple simple drug or something.
so fabulous uh, to see the Spanish Barbas in action, all the influence on so many lives over the years uh, has just been really, I think, almost ineffable. And uh, the humanities really matters in terms of building empathy. And, and um, I just want to thank you for being, you know, Marie and Jack and, and, and um, Richard, for just being here and being who you are and inspiring.
is here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I was thinking, yeah. why are they the umbrella of the, of the center?